bringen sich. So I am sorry, my German is very, very basic. So I will have to do this in English, but uh, I'll try to be uh, as uh, clear as possible and uh, I promise not to use very long words. <laughs> so, uh, as you all know, because you're all stereo geeks here, uh, stereoscopy was invented in uh, the 1830s by this man, Sir Charles Whitstone. And by the way, this is a, a photo which was uh, issued as a carte de visite by the London Stereoscopic Company, but which was actually taken as a stereo. It was never published as a stereo. But anyway, so here is the man, the man who invented stereoscopy as we know it. And the man realized that if you present to each eye a different perspective drawn, drawn at the time from uh, each eye, from the left eye and from the right eye, if you fuse them, if you put them together and the brain fuses them, you create, okay, you create the illusion of death. So, uh, Whitstone presented his first uh, mirror stereoscope in uh, 1838. He invented stereoscopy in 1832, but he was a busy man, so it took him six years before he was ready to present it to the world uh, 181 years ago on the 21st of June 1838. This is his first stereoscope, a mirror stereoscope. So you put the nose where the, where the, the, the hollow is here. Sorry. Uh, yeah. can do it. <laughs> and uh, so, and you've got the pictures on either side. So it is a mirror stereoscope, reflective stereoscope. Now, when Whitstone presented his stereoscope to the world, a photography did not exist. So he used drawings, and this is one of the few remaining original drawings <laughs> done by Whitstone that have survived, and uh, we found it in the collections of the Science Museum in London. And I'm glad to say that we are doing our best to bring it back to uh, King's College London. This is another one which was not uh, in his original presentation. It's a glass, as you can see. It's far from perfect, but remember, photography was not invented yet, so he had to draw everything by hand. Uh, as soon as photography was in invented, what well, revealed to the world in 1839, Whitstone realized it was the best way to uh, promote his invention and he asked um, Will Henry Fox Talbot to do karyotypes for him. So this is not a real uh, step, well it is a step, it is an accidental stereo by uh, William Henry Fox, Fox Talbot. Okay, I have problems with the, with the mic. Uh, so this is what it should have been like. It's about an angle of 25%, so it's a bit exaggerated. But you have to remember that when Talbot took the first stereos, the angle was 49.5%. The photos, unfortunately, have disappeared. Well, we haven't found them yet, but I'm still looking. So, but even if we find them, they will be unfused, unfortunately. Here is another one, this is a much better, again an accidental stereo by Fox Talbot and a bust of Patroclus. This one works better, the angle between the two shots is uh, more sensible. And so this is what stereo prototypes could have looked like, well they, this is what they look like. Uh, as you know, um, Whitstone stereoscope was too big to be to become popular, so in 1849, this man, Sir David Brewster, invented the lenticular stereoscope. Well, actually, he did not invent it, uh, uh, Whitstone invented it before him, but that's another story I won't get into. And he couldn't find anybody in England to, uh, to develop the, the invention for him, so he went to France, found uh, an optician, Louis Jules Dubosc, who built his stereoscope, and uh, the stereoscope was introduced back in Britain in 1851 during the Great Exhibition, and after a few years, it, didn't, it, take, it took a few years, um, there was a craze for stereoscopy, and people started buying, and of course, uh, publishers started manufacturing millions and millions of stereoscopes photos which were sold all over the world. 
the stereoscope was introduced in the middle class parlor and uh, the London Stereoscopic Company's motto at the time was no home without a stereoscope. Mm -hmm. And we're still far from it, unfortunately. But we, we, we're still trying. <laughs> uh, all classes of society were fond of the stereoscope. Here you can see people playing cards, but on the side you can see a man looking at stereos. So here it is, you can see the stereoscope on the <laughs> table and you can see some people actually not playing cards, but looking at stereo. So it was a very popular uh, medium. It was just like watching television in the 50s and 60s. It was that popular. Everybody uh, wanted to see the world in 3D. And of course, these cars were produced by millions. Lots of them disappeared, but a lot of them have survived. And this is where collecting begins. People started collecting stereo cards and a lot of these collections have survived and this is what I'm going to talk about today. How do you collect <laughs> stereos? So all the photos you're going to see are from Dr. May's collection. Uh, over 100,000 100, photos and as of uh, next week there will be 178,000 photos because we just bought a huge collection of 78,000 images. Mm. So it was going to take <laughs> some time to go through, but it's uh, fascinating and very exciting. Unbelievable. Mm. So, uh, it all began for Dr. May with uh, cereals. <coughs> cereals, bitter big cereals to be more precise, and in the packets of cereals, there were these cereals you can see. And if you, <coughs> if you sent a uh, one shilling, no, six pence, <coughs> two coupons, you would get a stereoscope like this one, the Vista Screen Stereoscope. And this is what Dr. May did. And the first photo he ever saw in 3D was this one, the two hippos. <laughs> and this is what he discovered in his uh, pack, uh, cereal packet. And when he put it in the stereoscope like this, <laughs> this is Dr. May, uh, a bit older now, but uh, this is what he did when he was 12 years old and he discovered this image. So that was the first image he saw in stereo. And we still have the image and the stereoscope in the collection because Dr. May never throws away anything. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good for an archivist of them. So this is the whole thing. Uh, so he started collecting <coughs> with big pictures and one day he bought the camera you see at the top, which is not a 3D camera, it's just a very, very cheap camera, a Woolworth camera, and he decided to make his own stereos. And at the bottom left you can see his first attempts, he recreated Wittebix stereo cards with his camera, which he, he did the cha-cha method, he took one image, moved the camera, took another image, and then he developed the photos and uh, of course put them together and this is these are two of the first images he has we still have them and if you look at the at the card he actually created a company at the time which was called see through limited see through limited and that was in 1959 he was only 12 and that was the beginning of his collection this is the first photo we took you can see a ladder, you can see his dad on the ladder, he was painting the kitchen uh, ceiling. The photo is far from perfect, but he was only 12 years old. He was using a mono camera, and so it was a very good effort. Uh, this uh, picture was taken by his dad, and as you can see in the foreground, you see the table. They, they put the camera on the table, took the picture, still the camera and took another picture, but of course the camera was a bit uh, too far away on the table, so you can see the edge of the table. This is Dr. May, or Brian May at the time, <laughs> on his bike, the bike he got for Christmas. And that's how he started collecting. When he was touring with Queen, he would go to uh, trade fairs, he'd go to uh, antique shops, and he'd buy stereoscopes and stereoscopic cards. Sorry, no. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll do that, you know, because it's...
that better? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah, I think that will be better. Thank you very much. So, there are different ways of connecting. Lots of collectors connect differently. So, uh, we can connect by big names. Some people are only interested in big names. The big names are the, the, the best photographers ever, or the best names in the profession. So, for example, this is a very nice stereo picture by a French photographer called Edouard Baldus. He's a big name in photography, he's a very early photographer. So there are stereos by Baldus because most photographers in the 19th century tried stereoscopy at least a couple of times. This is another famous photographer. This is, uh, this is the, the house of the Légion d'honneur for the, the girls of the officers and the knights of the Légion of Honor in France. And this is by Bayard and Bertal. Bayard is one of the inventors of photography, a much forgotten inventor. He, he invented a, a direct positive process uh, in 1839, just uh, when uh, Daguerre and uh, Talbot were revealing their processes. But he um, teamed up with uh, uh, Bertal, who was a cartoonist, and they produced lots of nice stereos. So this is the one, one of them. This is an actress. And you all know the name, although you may not know that he did stereos, and the name is Nadar, Gaspard Félix Tournachon, the great French portraitist and caricaturist as well. Nadar took some stereos later in his life. This is uh, another nice photograph by a great name as well of photography. This is H.P. Henry Peach Robinson. And these, the, the, the following ones, so this is the uh, um, Belgian marbles in, in a British Museum. This is a nice, a nice um, still life. And here is another statue from the British Museum as well, well, sorry. And these photos are all by Roger Fenton, who is better known for his, uh, the photos he took during the Crimean War in the 1850s, in the mid 1850s. This one, a study of uh, um, Don Quixote in his study, is by Lake Price. So these are all the, the things you can see on the photo. Sorry, this is, the, this is what you can see on the photo. Lake Price, RA photographer. Royal Academy, RA stands for Royal Academy. Uh, a lot of these photographers were either uh, draftsmen or painters themselves. This one is a very nice image too. Uh, and this was taken by another famous photographer. His name is, may not be as familiar as the other one, but he was a great photographer, a great landscape photographer. And this is William Setchfield, William Russell Setchfield. So some people only collect big names in photography. You can also collect by processes. As you know, there have been lots of processes since the invention of photography. And we find that as well in Dr. May's collection. This is a daguerreotype. This is one of the very first stereos because it shows the inside of the Crystal Palace, the original 1851 Crystal Palace, when the exhibition was being dismantled. So this is just after the end of the exhibition and it is being dismantled. But this is a very, very early one of the earliest uh, stereos we have in the collection, 1851. This is another daguerreotype, a very, very sharp one, and this is a very common uh, subject matter as well, larder. You know, people nowadays photograph uh, what they eat or photograph the, the contents of their fridge. Well, in the 19th century, people photographed their larder because it made a very nice still life and it was a way of showing that your wife was a very good housekeeper. <laughs> uh, this is another daguerreotype. This is less uh, common. This is an event. We don't know, unfortunately, what the event was, but it must have been important because there are, there are a lot, lots of policemen around. And this was taken in London, very near St. Martin in the Fields. For those who know London, the St. Martin in the Field is the church next to the National Gallery. So this is a very early daguerreotype from the National Gallery. Of course, there are lots of portraits as well in the collection, and most of the daguerreotypes, uh, most of the portraits are, were actually tinted. 
The Victorians didn't know color. They couldn't take color photographs. This came much later, but they knew how to tint these images. And if you've ever tried to tint a stereo, you will realize how good they were because this, this looked very natural. Uh, there are some very famous names in the daguerreotype uh, business. Of course, this is a group by Antoine Claudet. He was a Frenchman when he was living and working in Britain. This is another of his uh, tinted daguerreotypes. So he was one of the very first to take daguerreotypes. Uh, he was one of the very first to take to open a studio in London, actually, in 1841. And as soon as stereoscopy appeared, he was he was there. And he, he was the first to advertise stereoscopic portraits in 1851. So lots of photos by uh, Antoine Claudet in Dr. May's collection. Look, look at the, the tinting. It works even in 3D, which is amazing. And all everything, the, the, the chain here she's wearing around the neck, this is gold paint. Uh, and very, it, it had to be painted with a, just one, one hair of a brush because it's so, so small. Uh, he was very pop. Uh, he was very fond of uh, photographing soldiers in their bright red uniform. Here and again, all the the the, the gold, the gold stuff, the buttons and everything. Uh, even on the sword, the sheath of the sword, everything. Another famous photographer for the daguerreotype portraits was T. R. Williams, Dr. May's favorite photographer, and this is a portrait of his daughter stepping out of the frame. And again, an, an allusion to painting and photography. Uh, this kind of images destroyed uh, miniature uh, paintings. And a lot of miniature painters actually started coloring, tinting daguerreotypes because they knew uh, the technique. This is another of the T.R. Williams uh, daguerreotypes, a portrait of a child. And look how natural it looks. Look, look at the way he's holding his hat. It's very natural. He doesn't look tense, and it must have taken a few, maybe 10 or 15 seconds holding still for a child at the time. This must Whoa. have been quite difficult, but it, it managed very well. Another one by T.R. Williams, this one I call the eligible bachelor. We don't know who he was, but uh, he was probably a wealthy man. Look at the, his hat, his clothes, everything, and he's uh, showing himself to his best vantage. And this is another daguerreotype by uh, John J. Bezid with Mayall, a group, a family group. Again, very difficult to photograph children, and uh, these portraits look so alive. The people, you could actually go in and talk to them because they look so alive, so much alive. Another one by J. Bezid, Mayall here. Very nice portrait of a gentleman. So lots of, all these are daguerreotypes, photos on metal, on a silver coated copper. So they were precious, they were expensive, and so they were kept very well usually. People treasured them, they were heirlooms. And this is another one of, uh, this is by Kilburn actually. This is a little girl by uh, William Kilburn. So a very nice portrait of a little girl. And again here, the, the girl with the hat and the, the battle door on the, on the floor and basket. And they painted, all the backdrop was painted by a miniaturist. And uh, this one was uh, called Mancion. He was a, f a famous miniature painter at the, uh, at the beginning of his career. But then when Daguerreotype arrived, uh, he had to, uh, to convert to uh, painting, tinting Daguerreotype. So this is another one of his, uh, of his uh, work. Another daguerreotype by Kjellberg, a nice uh, lady in black with a handbag, which is not very common to see in uh, early photos of the time. Uh, after daguerreotype, at the same time as daguerreotypes came tintypes, uh, sorry, calotypes. Calotypes were paper, photographs on paper, and they used the negative process. So first you had a negative, and then you had to print the negative to, to uh, again, to get a positive picture. So this is very interesting because it's a very early stereoscopic daguerreotype. Uh, it shows the shops on the Pont Neuf in Paris, and we know that they were all destroyed uh, just at the beginning of 1852. So th this is a very early daguerreotype of Paris, a very expensive one too. And this is uh, the Pont Louis Philippe again in Paris. It is 
the pool with Philippe, although it says on the bridge itself, Pont de la Réforme. And this is a name that the bridge, apparently somebody's trying to get to come in. And this is a name that the bridge didn't keep for very long. In 1852, again, the name was changed back to Pont de Philippe. So we know that this is a very early image. And these images usually bear, bear on, the, on, the, on, the bot, uh, on the back uh, a blind stamp, uh, sorry, a wet stamp, type of type, or some pictures. <laughs> Departed spirit of my friend, are you there? <laughs> so maybe we don't to start the arts. Anyway, uh, another process was the ambrotype. Ambrotype, it's a, it's a picture on glass, it's a picture on collodion, it's a collodion picture. And <coughs> instead of making a negative and a positive on paper, you just put something black behind the image, which is very light, and you get this, uh, this uh, positive here. And this one is quite striking. This man sitting on a grave in a, in a churchyard in Britain. So there are not very many uh, ambrotypes, but they could be tinted like this one by Nicolas Henri Badier, a French photographer. So you could also tint uh, ambrotypes. They are as old as uh, daguerreotypes, most of them, and they are very, very nice, but uh, they are not as common as um, stereo daguerreotypes. And this is another example of a very nice. Very nice for it. If, when you blow it up, you can, you can still see it's very, very sharp. Collodion is very sharp. And the photos had to be developed immediately as soon as they were taken. They had to be taken whilst the collodion was still wet and they had to be developed immediately. Uh, something else as well, another process is uh, sorry, I missed one. Yeah. This one is a photo on glass by Ferrier. Claude Marie Ferrier, he was a specialist of the photos of glass, and they were made into positive glass positives, uh, wonderful images, very sharp. And this is a view of the Place du Châtelet in Paris. Uh, of course, it has changed a lot now. Lots of cars, no cars at the time, only horses and carts and people walking in the middle of the streets. Try that today, and you will get run over very quickly. This is a famous street in Paris, the Rue de Rivoli, and at the, at the back you can see the Tuileries Palace. Uh, this, this part uh, still exists. It's uh, one of the pavilions, Pavilion de Flore, I think, or Marsan, I can never, I can never tell. But the rest of the palace was destroyed. And again, you can see life as it was in Paris in the 1850s. This is a view again by Ferrier of Constantinople, a panorama of Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople, as the song goes. Uh, there is another process, sorry, I'm going a bit too fast. This is a cyanotype. So we have also cyanotypes. Uh, unfortunately, this one is not very good. The 3D is not very good, so that's why I'm not, I'm showing it as a, as a flat uh, stereo. Uh, this is a tin type. So a tin type is the same as a um, Number of type, it's a collodion picture, but this time on metal. Right? Metal. So you have to, to cut the, the, the plate in, in two and then invert the two pictures to get the stereo. And this is what it looks like in 3D. So this is just a point of a dog, but interesting. Not very common either. Tin types are not very common. This one is even rarer. This is a panel type of a picture, a stereoscopic picture on leather. Yes, so they, were, they, they tried everything. The Victorians tried really everything. And then, of course, uh, color. They started working on color processes. And this is one of the very first. This is a chromograph. And as you can see, blue at the top, red at the, in the middle, and green. Oh, wait a minute, it's, it's black and white. Yes, it is black and white, so three black and white pictures taken through three different filters. The first one through a blue filter, the second one through a red filter, the third one through a green filter, and then you would put them here in this contraption, the oh eye scope. So as you can see so cool. on, the, on the left here, so this is where the blue would go, blue, red, and green. And if you manage to align the pictures correctly, so for the other side, sorry, sorry guys, blue, red, and green, 
Uh, if you manage to put the pictures correctly, <laughs> this is what you would get. Wow. And these are real colors. Through, yes, it's wonderful, really. Through, sorry, no. Yeah, one more, sorry. So this is, this is wonderful. And the, the problem is to align the three pictures, of course. But when you align them properly, this is what you get. And this is the first true color process an okay. ice process in the 18, uh, 1890s, okay. mid 1890s. So very nice images. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so here is another one here, of the painting, cool. the painting and uh, the, 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 the painter's palette as well, and his box and his box of colors. So very nice image as well. And this one, of course, my favorite uh, advertisements in colors. Advertisements for British products, almonds, mustard, sunlight, silk, etc. So this this is really 3D and color. So this this is the beginning of color photography mm. in the 1890s. 1890s. Uh, this process is not so well known, and if you can read on the from the side, this is actually the signature on the, on the left hand side of the Lumia brothers. The Lumia brothers are more famous for their uh, cinematography mm -hmm. uh, process, but they also, uh, they were very interested in stereo and in color, and they wanted both, they wanted color and stereo. So this is a trichrome process, um, not very many uh, examples of this have survived, and um, oh. these, the colors are simply amazing. Mm. Uh, I mean, I tried to make it uh, look as uh, nice as possible on screen, but when you look at the original, I mean, honestly, I've never seen anything so beautiful as that, the best color process ever invented. Uh, three layers of gum, gum bichromate, so it took ages to take to make one image, and they did it in stereo, so the alignment must have taken them such a long time. So here is another example. Uh, they, they produced, they couldn't produce very many, so, uh, and they, the, the exposure times were so long that they couldn't do portraits or to take, take the camera outside, it had to be still life. So, as you can imagine, the process was great, but uh, it didn't work commercially. So this is one of the last, one, last ones, we, we bought a very nice edition. The colors are really so beautiful when you look at it in 3D, it's really amazing. But, as I said, it didn't work well commercially because, because it was too difficult and only limited to still lives. So no portraits, nothing of the kind. So they, they went back to the drawing board and they invented the autochrome process. So autochromes are also invented, were also invented by the Linear Brothers. And this time it was possible to take the camera outside. And, and again, the autochrome is a, a black and white process and the, the colors appear because there is a sort of a, a well actually it's potato starch which is dyed in three different colors and spread over the, the emulsion and so it's a, it worked and you could take photos inside as well in low light uh, as here in a museum a display case and paintings on the wall so these are some of the some of the tiger, uh, the, the amber, uh, sorry uh, uh, the autochromes, yes, in uh, Dr. May's collection. And they, these are very small, they are about uh, Jules Richard um, size, uh, four, 45 by one, 107 uh, millimeters, so quite small. And with autochromes you could do portraits. So it became very popular and it was one of the, the most common color processes until, until this, well, nearly the Second World War. So this is, sorry, I missed one, but I can ask the one. Okay, collecting by celebrities now. Some people only collect celebrities, portraits of famous people. So let's start with one of the most famous people in Britain at the time, Queen Victoria. This is Queen Victoria and her youngest daughter, Princess Beatrice, the one who edited um, her mother's journals and, uh, and uh, erased all the naughty bits out of it. Uh, and uh, Queen Victoria here was, uh, was a widow at the time. She, this was uh, taken after the death of her husband. And of course she was not 
smiling at all. She was a very um, sad woman at the time. This is another wonderful um, tinted daguerreotype. type. This is Princess Vicky, Victoria's eldest daughter. This was taken in 1856 on her 16th birthday by T.R. Williams. And this is, of course, she became the crown princess of Germany. Uh, this is another of uh, Victoria's children. This is Prince Albert Edward, who, became, who later became King Edward VII, and his wife, his uh, new wife, um, Alexandra, Princess of Denmark. This was taken by William Ingram and his team in, uh, in 1863. This is a British Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston. Queen Victoria didn't like him at all, but he was photographed here by John Moffat, a uh, um, Scottish photographer. Here he is again, much older, uh, on the left with his wife sitting, and next to him is uh, Princess Alexandra, she was still the princess. Queen Victoria reigned for 60, nearly 64 years, and sitting next to her is again uh, the Prince of Wales, a much older and a stouter Prince of Wales, and I must say, what I like best in the picture is the little girl hiding on the right. Not to be in the picture, but you can still see her. That's, that's really wonderful, a wonderful thing. Uh, this is uh, another famous man at the time. Well, the, the bust is uh, the bust of Admiral Nelson, the, uh, the victor of uh, Trafalgar. And the man standing next to the bust is his valet, Robert Drummond. And uh, he was there when Nelson was killed. He was on board the victory. He was there when they put his body in the barrel of rum to take it back to England. He was there when they sold the rum. And uh, he was there much, much, longer, much uh, longer after that. And uh, there he is now. Uh, this one is, uh, well, I'm sure you recognize him. This is Isomba Kingdom Brunel. He was one of the brightest engineers of his time. And here he is sitting next to the Great Eastern, the biggest, biggest, heaviest, longest ship ever built at the time. You may recognize this gentleman. You probably, you've probably read his books. This is Charles Dickens. In 1858, he was about to read one of his books, so he's holding a copy of his books, and he, he gave public lectures. He, he would read uh, chapters from his books. And he was taken here just before his lecture by uh, Herbert Watkins. And here is another famous stereo of him by the same photographer, and he's pretending to be writing one of his famous novels. So, Charles Dickens. This character is uh, known as what well, was known as General Tom Thumb, but his real name was Charles Sherwood Stratton. He was an American citizen. He was a very short person, and uh, he made the most of it with uh, his friend Mr. Barnum, and he visited England several times, he performed in front of the Queen, and he was a celebrity. He, there are dozens of photos of this short, uh, short person who um, actually managed his career very well, got married, had children, and died a wealthy man. This is uh, Augustus Lowell Reeve. He was a conchologist. Conchologist is somebody who is interested in shells, not the company, but uh, the actual shells you find in the, on the beach. So he was a conchologist, and he was also uh, the publisher of the first book illustrated with stereos in 1858, a book by Charles Kiedismeyer. So he was a famous person. He was also the publisher of the Stereoscopic Magazine, which gave stereos to its uh, subscribers every month. This is Robert Stevenson, Stevenson from the family of the Stevensons, the inventor of the locomotive, of the, the steam engine, or the, lo the locomotive engine, yeah. And uh, that was his son, and he was an MP as well, a member of parliament. This is different kind of celebrity. This is a courtesan. This is Lola Montes. She was the mistress of King Leopold of Bavaria. And she, uh, she was a dancer. She was an artist. She, was, she became a lecturer. And uh, this photo was taken in uh, 1859 by the London Stereoscopic Company. She was lecturing on crinoline and women. And she died shortly after the photo was taken. 
This is a very uh, tired looking emperor, ex emperor Napoleon III, uh, just after his return from captivity, after the defeat of uh, 1870, he was held prisoner for a couple of months and then he was exiled in Britain in 1871. And the, the, uh, the photo is also by the London Stereoscopic Company. It was taken just days after he, he, he came to England. And this is the uh, Next one is the actress Ellen Terry, who started very early. She was just a child when she started her career. She married a famous, a famous uh, painter, George Watts. The marriage didn't last very long, and then she became this great actress, this great Victorian actress, and here she is at the end of her life in stereoscopy. You can also, of course, collect by events. Some people like events. And you find that in Dr. May's collection as well. This is the opening of the Crystal Palace, the Sydenham Crystal Palace in 1854, June 10, 1854. You can see the Queen here on, on the day. It's the Queen and uh, Queen Victoria and uh, uh, the suite. And behind her are 600 choir people, choristers, choir people, and the photographer. Uh, had to take the photos sequentially because he didn't have a binocular camera and he took the photos sequentially and he waited for a speech and it was a long speech so he had time to actually take the two images and put them as a stereoscopic tape. <laughs> the next one is, uh, was taken one year later. This is still Sydney Crystal Palace and the photo was taken during the visit uh, Emperor Napoleon III paid to England uh, in April 1855. So on the on the day in the front, sitting on the in the front, you can see. Uh, give you a close up. You can see from uh, left to right in the front row, Emperor Napoleon III, Queen Victoria, the Empress Eugenie, and Prince Albert, and all the people behind are the the courts and uh, the, the, the retinue of uh, the two. Imperial and Royal Couples. So 1855, the daguerreotype again. And you can see even closer here, so there they are, all four of them, famous people of the time, for the rulers of France and Britain. Uh, this one is a totally different event. This is a, um, an earthquake in Italy in 1857. So the photographer there, uh, took a lot of uh, pictures of uh, ruins after the earthquake and it was one of the first times such an event had been covered in stereo photography. This one is uh, very interesting. This is the death of um, Prince Jerome. He was uh, Jerome Napoleon. He was Napoleon the first only surviving brother and he died on the 1st of July 1860 and this is where his body was uh, laying, laying in state. The only thing is that this photo is a fake. This was actually staged in a studio by a photographer called Henri Lefort. It was impossible to take a real photo in the, in the, in the Palais Royal because it was very dim and of course nobody would have been allowed to take a photo of a dead famous person at the time. So he just restaged the whole thing in his studio. George Melies, the, the filmmaker, did that uh, many years later when he restaged in his studio for, for the cinema the coronation of King Edward VII. So that's so you could have fake news. Uh, this was fake news. <laughs> uh, this is another example of the same event, but this time, as you can see, they used uh, clay figures. They used uh, clay models to restage the thing. So you can see uh, Emperor Napoleon on the, on the, on the left. The Empress Eugenie kneeling, you can see uh, Prince Joe's son standing at the foot of the bed. So this was restaged, but this time with clay models. This is another event. This is a, a regatta in France in 1868. And you can see what people were wearing. Uh, they are on the beach, standing on the beach watching the, the yachts go by. And uh, they are protecting themselves from the sun with their parasols because in those days it was not good to be uh, sent out. This is another event. This is uh, the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71. This is a barricade, a Prussian barricade, just outside of Paris, near the Malmaison. So 
So they photograph events, even, even wars, in stereoscopy. This is the most famous uh, photo, this is a more famous photo. This is the, when they uh, destroyed the Colonne Vendôme in Paris in 1871 because it was, it was a, a symbol of uh, uh, the Napoleon dynasty, so they just uh, took it down and uh, it was photographed. So there are lots of photos of this uh, monument being pulled down or actually being down. Uh, this, is, this is one room in ruins, of course, on the Tuileries Palace after it was destroyed by fire. The, the rebels in 1871, there was a re another revolution in France, and they set fire to the Louvre, and uh, this is what uh, remained after the fire. So everything was destroyed. Of course, you can collect also by subject matter, and uh, there are lots of subject matters. Every subject matter under the sun was covered in stereo, including the sun. So if you are fond of Japan, and I know we have some Jap Jap Japanese friends here, uh, you, can, you can actually collect lots of stereo. So this is a, a, a stereo from 1859 by uh, Rossier, Pierre Rossier, a Swiss photographer, showing a Japanese soldier. And it must have looked very exotic for the people who actually saw that picture, the British people, the French people who saw that picture at the time. This is a more recent picture, but still very nice. So if you want to collect Japan, you can collect Japan with stereo. You will find lots and lots and lots of pictures. Uh, if you are interested in rural life, rural France here in, in the 1850s, you can also find whatever you want. So this is France as it was in the countryside in the 1850s, stereoscopically. These people are making chairs. Again, 1850s, sequential photograph, very early, very nice, nicely composed. Um, you can also collect open Bibles. Yes, that's a surprising subject matter, but there are dozens and dozens of pictures of open Bibles in Dr. May's collection and in other collections as well. It's a very common subject. So you, you, you just see an open Bible, and you can actually read the, read the text in the stereoscope, and it's quite a, a, astonishing. So I think I'm going to write an article about that, trying to understand why people would buy. Remember, stereos were meant to be bought. So why would people buy that? Anyway, you have also lots of uh, skeleton flowers. These were um, difficult to make, and so people didn't have the patience or the skill to make those boats, uh, stereos of them, and this is a stereo daguerreotype. Again, daguerreotype was very expensive. Who would buy such an image? Interesting question. So here is another example mm -hmm. by T.R. Williams, beautiful in death. Mm. The Victorians were fascinated by death and uh, mm. even dead flowers, like this one, dried flowers. Only the skeleton of the flower is kept. You can also uh, collect trains, 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 engines, locomotives. Uh, the the uh, steam engine was uh, considered an uh, invention of the devil at the time, and people were a bit afraid of it. Um, they thought that uh, they, it was going too fast, and uh, people, uh, people's lungs would explode uh, when they went through tunnels. But they were fascinated by these, uh, by these, uh, these things. And there are lots and lots of pictures of the steam engine. Difficult to find, actually, because they are collected by, not by stereo collectors, but by people who are interested in trains. So they are quite difficult to find. But they are very nice, and uh, there are lots and lots and lots of them. The Victorians loved their trains. You can also collect ghosts. There are hundreds of photos of ghosts. And uh, it's actually, it was, uh, Started, starting in, started in, uh, in the 1856-57, 1856, when David Brewster wrote a book and he described the technique. How can you take a photo of a ghost in 3D? And one year later, in December 1857, the London Stereoscopic Company started selling their first ghost in the stereoscopes. The first attempts were quite crude and didn't work very well, but after, after a couple of uh, trials and errors, they managed to, to, to produce very convincing ghosts. And this is a nice example here, a ghost appearing to people having dinner. And this is another one here. Again. Yeah, very convincing. And, uh, and it's actually 3D and it's see-through. So the technique was very 
simple. Since the exposures were very long, the people who are surprised here would stand still for 20 seconds, let's say, and the ghost would only stand still for 10 and then disappear. And it, it, it would appear as a presence somewhere, but of course, since the camera had also captured the background, what was behind the person, you could actually see through the ghost and you had the 3D effect as well. Very clever and very early. So lots, lots of pictures of ghosts. Of course, sorry, the, 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 main, the main way of collecting is by composition. Uh, there was a very, I was in Akron, I was fortunate to be in Akron this year, and uh, Felix Russo did a very interesting workshop about uh, making better stereoscopic compositions. It's interesting because we have to, to, uh, to learn that nowadays, but in the 19th century, a lot of the stereoscopic photographers were actually trained as painters, so they knew how to compose a picture, and very quickly they understood how, how it worked well, with the stereoscope, and they knew how to compose a picture in 3D. And uh, some of them are very, very, very effective. Very good 3D, sometimes a bit too much, but again, they were trying, and uh, remember, every photo had to be developed as soon as it was taken, and uh, it was in glass, and uh, uh, there was a lot of preparation, you needed a dark room, it's not just uh, taking a digital camera and snapping two images, or uh, just one. Uh, it was far more difficult than that, and the composition is always good, um, and they, they knew exactly uh, how to, uh, to, uh, to make it interesting, even if it's a very simple subject like this one, shuddering next to a web. This is another example of a nice composition. All the people, they are not aligned, they are just uh, staged in different levels of the picture. So everything they did was very nice, even this one, look at that. The, the, the fishermen here, and all the, the we, we actually go, we can actually step into the picture very easily because it's so well composed. And these are very early examples. This one, for example, you can see from the horse, the horse has moved. Mm. It's a uh, sequential photo. So he asked the photographer, asked the, everybody to stand still. But of course the horse didn't do a step. Maybe it was a French horse. <laughs> so this is, this is, I'm oh, sorry, this is another one. This is um, um, London, this is Temple Bar. Again, look at the composition with all the different, different layers and the 3D is amazing, you can actually nearly step into the wheelbarrow. <laughs> I wouldn't advise it because it's full of tarmac. So uh, uh, here is another one, staged in a studio. So this one is called the artist's head taken off. And all the, the different busts and statues are very well uh, lit and composed. So again, a very nice picture. And look at this one. Very simple, but very effective. Again, with a wheelbarrow and this little girl. And again, uh, the exposure must have been at least 10 or 15 seconds. And she didn't move, not too much. And this one, family, family at the well. Again, this is posed and staged probably, but look at all the different levels, people in the foreground and the guy in the background. So it's very, very well composed for 3D. And, um, very difficult at the time. This is by uh, Francis Bedford, this is Hereford, again, people in the foreground and all the different people along the, along the bank of the river and the city and the bridge in the background. Very nicely composed. This is by James Elliott, this is a stage scene, again, this is called uh, the Ragged School, with everything, again, you can go from the, the, the chart of the, the, the foreground to the blackboard in the background you can explore and see all the expressions of the children. And again, this is posed several seconds. This is the Easting, this is the Robbers Lane, again, with the, the, the tree in the foreground, adding to the composition of the people in the middle plane and in the background as well. So very, very nicely composed. Even this one, very simple. Again, who would buy that? But this was sold, nice and quiet image very nicely composed. Here is another example here. Yeah. And this one, lots of photos of waterfalls in the, 
and look at all the, the way that people are always, you know, just uh, scattered all over the image, foreground and background, and middle ground. This is a, an image of Carisbrook Castle. Castle. The castle was too far away to, to be interesting in stereo, so there was a cart in the foreground, people in the middle ground, etc. Very, again, very nice looking photo. Another picture of people uh, washing along the banks of the river, washing and bathing. You can see two bathers in the water. Washer women by a, by a river again. Again, the composition, very, very hyper, this one, but uh, still interesting. Four women. Same one, but this time in the studio. Look, well, look at the depth of the image. Even though the, this is a backdrop in the background, this is a very interesting picture as far as the goes. Hmm? So, this is that, of course. Yeah. You, you, you saw that at home. Oh, yeah. It looks like oh, the other one. Okay. Yeah, oh, this is the oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So you see, just the flat one. Yes, one. Yeah. So it's a big one. Really. really, they knew what they were doing. Mm, Another wow. example of a stage scene of a laundry girls. <clears throat> Can you imagine what? Why people bought this one? <laughs> <laughs> This one in a cafe in France outside. So probably the photographer was probably there, just asked the people who were just uh, sitting there to to, to uh, stand still and uh, photograph them. It's a very nice, still a very nice composition with a waiter on the side. This one, very simple in the garden, is still life. It took me some time to realize something was wrong with the image. And actually, if you look, if you look on the watering can here. Here, if you if you close one eye, you will see that on one picture there is a fly, and in the other picture there is no no fly. So it was a sequential image, but something was wrong when I was looking at it. So uh, another okay. one here, the greenhouse again, composition very nice. You can actually see the depth there. A nice portrait of an old man. We don't know who he was, but again, very nice composition. His hands in the foreground. This is a, a monument to a people who drowned, a lady who actually got drowned in, in a river and they, they erected a monument and photog the photographer decided, cho chose to uh, photograph pe people from the back and he, he made another one and, sorry, and again he photographed them from the back from a distance and you can see another one on the bridge but again the composition is very nicely, nicely done. Uh, next one is a picture on the beach. Um, this was the time when they were start starting to make uh, instantaneous photographs. So this is a real beach, a real, real people. Nobody was asked to uh, stand still. And you can see some blurring in, in some places. Uh, they started to, to actually take uh, scenes of people uh, in, uh, in their everyday life. So this is a very nice view from uh, Cairo in Egypt. Very nice street and I found a, a painting which was exactly taken at the same spot. Some very, very simple scenes like this girl reading here, or this little girl with a, a doll. Very simple but nicely composed, mother and a child. A donkey ride, so of course the donkey is a stuffed donkey, but still, nice image, and the, the backdrop is painted, but it works very well. This one is called the nursery, and uh, again, can you imagine three children all standing still for at least 10 or 15 seconds, mm -hmm. and they look so natural, they're not even looking at the photographer, they mm -hmm. look natural, and uh, I don't know if children would be able to do this nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very nice photo by uh, John Moffat of a uh, fish room in uh, New Haven, look at the, the depth of the image. Again, they were asked to stand still. This one is a very simple, but it's becoming one of my favorite pictures of, at the moment. I love the composition, how simple it is, and how efficient it is. This one is staged in the studio. This is called Going to the Market by James Selgut. Very efficient. And this one is The Gleaner, again by James Selgut. Same model, same studio, same setting, but different, different scene. This one is a portrait of Ophelia, 
by the same uh, James Stanley too. Again, look at the composition, it's just perfect. This one is called The Captive by the same. And this one is okay, The Ferry. It's not very often that you can actually, mm. in Victorian photos, you can see the subject coming out of the screen. And this is a very, mm. very rare example of that. This one is called the ghost. I wonder why. It's not really a ghost, but uh, she seems uh, just a flesh and bone woman. But anyway, it's called the ghost. This is a sort of allegory. This is uh, um, Aphrodite and uh, Cupid, like Venus and Cupid, after a painting. This is a, a very nice uh, still life by William England. So just. Uh, a statue, a stereo, a stereo photograph, a stereoscope, a clock, st statuettes, photos on the photos on the on the wall, and a, a painted backdrop. But very nice still life. Wow. Uh, this Ooh. is very interesting. Do you know what these are? These are props. These are props used by a firm of French photographers. These are all the props they use in their images, and they they actually published a couple of those, and they are amazing because when, once you've seen the props you can recognize the photos immediately. Oh, I've seen that before, I know this is a photo by. And uh, very useful, so why would they photograph their props? It's interesting, but they did, they photographed them in 3D. And here is an example of, a, it's called the ocean, and they use about half of the props I've just uh, seen you in that photograph. Uh, and uh, once, you know, once you know that, you know immediately who they are. Uh, here is another one by the same photographers here. <coughs> this is a studio one, and a very a much simpler one, but you can you can recognize the the, the vase here. Sorry, sorry. Oops. Oh, I got something wrong. Sorry. 